The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, Lord. Lord. Jesus said to the disciples, Whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. The Gospel of the Lord. So two weekends ago, we had our annual meeting of our synod. We call it the Synod Assembly. As many of you know, I grouse a lot about Synod Assembly. I call it Synod Disassembly. And <laughs> I do that because it's often long and it's boring, and, and sometimes it feels like we're trying to take two hours of really important stuff that we have to do and cram it into two days of meeting. <laughs> that's basically what we do. And, and you know, it's important we have to do it, but it takes up two days and it takes away from things that I'm trying to do at church and I'm trying to do at home. So at the end, most of us pastors, we sit back and we go, okay, once it's over, we can breathe a sigh of relief and we can get a little bit of a break. Unfortunately, that did not happen this year. On the Monday after Senate Assembly, I got a text message from Pastor Christine, and she had just found out that the husband of one of our pastor buddies had taken his life on Monday morning. So we were shocked. We were confused, we didn't know what to do, and as many of you know from being in situations like that, there's often nothing you can do other than pray and wait and find out what's going to happen next. We were asked not to inundate Kate, our friend, with lots of emails and texts and phone calls and things like that and to give her a little bit of space. And so over the next day or so, we continued to wait and pray and to make sure that people that needed to know found out. Still. I kind of thought, there must be something I can do. And so on Tuesday evening, Blake and I took a care package down to Kate's house. We left the package on her doorstep without knocking on the door or trying to go in or anything. I did text her and say, we have left a care package on your doorstep. She texted me back and said, knowing you, I know what it is. And I said, yes, you're right. And um, I made sure that I cleared my calendar so that I can be at the memorial service on Saturday. At some point, I remember thinking to myself, you know, it's the least I can do to do these things. It's the least I can do. Have you ever said that to yourself or to somebody else? What does that really mean? It's the least that I can do. As I started to think about it, it occurred to me that ironically, the least I could do is not really the least that I can do. It's actually the most that I can do in that one particular moment in time. It's not a lot. It's not very big in the vast scheme of things. But it's the most that I could do at that one particular moment. Now, of course, the real work begins for those of us who are Kate's friends and family. That over the next days and weeks and months and, and maybe even years, we have to be there for her and help her out in ways that are a lot more than those first few little things that we did in the first week. If all that we ever did was the least that we could do, those, those you know, send a care package and be at the memorial service, if that's all we ever did, it really would be the least that we could do, and it would be totally insufficient. You all probably know that from times in your lives where you've had to support somebody who's gone through something really bad, or when you yourself have been bad. The least that we can do is not the end. It's really just the beginning. And I was thinking about that this week as I was reading the Gospel reading. These three brief verses are the conclusion of Jesus' instructions as he sends his disciples out to share the good news with other people in the community. And as they go out, Jesus uses this image of a cup of cold water that may be shared with them by people to help them out as they go along on this journey. Jesus often uses small, seemingly insignificant things to make a point about God's kingdom. He lifts up the widow in the temple who puts in two small copper coins that are worth a penny. He talks about the kingdom of God being like a tiny little mustard seed. 
And here in today's Gospel reading, he uses the image of just a cup of cold water. At first glance, these things, they just don't seem like that big of a deal. In fact, they seem like many of those things that are the least somebody could do. But like other things that are the least, they are valued not because they're small, but because they are the most that somebody can do at that particular moment in time. The widow, when she goes to the temple and she puts in a penny, puts in everything she has, it is the most that she can do at that moment in time. The seed, which is the symbol of the kingdom of God, is not valued because it's tiny, but because it has the potential to grow and become more, but it's the most that it can be at that one moment. And the cup of cold water, where Jesus is talking about as you journey along, somebody may hand you a cup of cold water, value that because that's the most they can do as you're moving from town to town. Here, have some water so you do not die of thirst. It's the most somebody can do at that one particular moment. These things, they seem small, and they are. And Jesus is telling his disciples that God notices and values even small things. His disciples should notice them and value them as well. But those things are valued not because they're small, but because they represent the most that somebody can do at any given particular moment in time. And one of the things that worries me when we read any of these passages is that too often we tend to glamorize the smallness of these things. Because if smallness is what God really wants, then we can tell ourselves that we can just stop at the few small things maybe we've already done. We convince ourselves that the mission that God calls us to in life really shouldn't take that much time or energy or money. And the least that we can do turns into all that we think we really need to do. That kind of thinking, it doesn't work well in any of our personal relationships. It doesn't work well in our communities. It doesn't work in our relationship with God. The least that we can do should be the starting point, not the ending point, of any relationship that actually matters. So, you know, as we get ready to celebrate Independence Day this week, it strikes me that sometimes we even do this as we express patriotism in our country. Right? There are certain things that, that we say, well, this is the least I can do to show my love for my country, and, and they're fine, as long as we don't stop there. Patriotism ends up being something like, well, the least I can do is fly the flag to show my love for my country. That's great, and I do it, and that's good, as long as it doesn't stop there. It also means that I've got to continue on and advocate for the rights and the freedoms that the flag represents. If patriotism ends with the least that I can do, it means that I talk about how grateful I am for veterans, the sacrifices veterans have made, and I, you know, I, I talk in very serious tones, and I look very serious about that. And that's all good and well, unless, but it also has to include going beyond that, and among other things, to advocate for the care of veterans, wounded veterans, and their families, and make sure that they continue to get the care that they need. The least that I can do for patriotism sounds like often I'm going to post my righteous indignation on Facebook and Twitter and all kinds of things and tell you about how, my, how the opposing political perspective for mine is terrible and horrible. And I think that's great and that's fine. But unless I also do things, many other things, including get off my butt and actually go out and vote and make my voice heard in a way that actually matters, then that's not enough. It's not sufficient. Doing the least that I can do is not enough to support my country. It's not enough to support my friends. It's not enough to grow in my relationship with God. And so when Jesus is lifting up small things, he's calling us to a beginning, not to an end. He's calling us to live in ways that grow our relationship with God and with one another. And he's calling us to a way of life that's actually worth more than the least that we can do. And that's why the least that we can do should never be allowed to be an excuse for all that we'll do. 
It should be the most that we can do at any particular time and place. And after all, the one who calls us to the most that we can do is the one who did the most that anybody can do for another person. Jesus died and rose again to give us the gift of eternal life. And that gift is not supposed to inspire us to sit back, do the least that we can do, and just wait for the end when God will take us to heaven. It's rather supposed to be a gift that inspires us to get up and go out and do the most that we can do to share God's love and God's presence with everybody in the world around us. Now sometimes the least that we can do may often feel like just a cup of cold water. And that's okay if it's the most that we can do at any point in time. God notices and God honors those small acts. But God doesn't want us to stay stuck there. Instead, God calls us to continue to ask, what's next? And to follow Jesus by being people who do the most that we can do to share God's love and God's presence with the whole world.